Hi everyone, you're watching episode 66 of Yield TV. Hey, welcome back. Uh, this is episode 66. I have to go back and check the numbers because uh, we're getting into the higher numbers of episodes now. Uh, so today is Thursday, January 28th, 2021. Uh, we're going to get to talk with Jamie Burke, who is the CEO of Outlier Ventures. He's also uh, a co-founder of a virtual NFT art district. Uh, in Decentraland called 100X Art. So I'm excited to explore that more with him. We previously had DCL Blogger on, uh, who uh, goes by Maddie, and Maddie sort of was walking us through like his theses on Decentraland and the metaverse, and uh, Jamie is right there with him. So I'm really excited to dig more into uh, the future of the metaverse, how NFTs and DeFi really fall under the same umbrella and will be allies. So on that note, um, Jamie, welcome to Yield TV. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Finally, you got me on. It's an honor. Ab oh, no, no, no. Like I said, our honor. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, there's some. It's great to talk with you just because, again, like you know DeFi inside and out, but you are on the bleeding edge of the metaverse here with Decentraland. Uh, the 100X Art District, too, like we'll talk more about it, but it's such a, it's another like example of how community is just being rebuilt in the metaverse. And I mean, for me, it's been crypto voxels, the token smart community, and then what I've seen you all been building here, that those are the stories I like to show off to friends as like, see, I'm right, you're wrong, the metaverse is here to stay. So uh, anyways, Jamie, why don't we start with uh, uh, a bit about your background. Like, how did you get into crypto in the first place? When did you uh, get started with Outlier Ventures? And, and then would love to pivot into, you know, how did you uh, see the light with the metaverse? Yeah, so I founded Outlier Ventures um, around seven years ago. Time's obviously a funny thing in crypto. Um, even more so in, in a world of COVID, you kind of lose track of things. But it's, it's around seven years ago. And at that time, obviously, the world looked very different in the context of crypto and, and blockchain. Um, I, I came about Bitcoin originally because I was um, an angel investor just on my own, investing in technology companies. And I was looking at a form of peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending on a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform. And so that kind of got me looking at peer-to-peer -peer money and came across Bitcoin. And like most people, you know, blown away. And uh, it just began to occupy an increasing amount of my intellectual capability, what little there is, um, and, and time. <laughs> and, um, yeah. and very quickly, I, I kind of just realized that I wanted to, this was going to be something, I don't know what, but something that I definitely wanted to spend at least the next decade on and kind of commit to. So I, um, I think I went to the first Bitcoin conference in... London, um, and then around that time found my uh, co-founder, a guy called Aaron Van Amers, Dutch guy who's a CTO. So I'm not a coder. By background, I spent a lot of time, my whole career working with technologists, um, kind of refer to myself as a creative technologist, and I can't code, but I can kind of just see how things might go together, um, at least directionally, which uh, seems to be quite handy uh, being an investor. So uh, I brought Aaron on board because you know, clearly this was going to be a very technical domain. I was going to be out of my depth. I'm still out of my depth. I still feel out of my depth every day. Oh, uh, yeah. and, uh, you know, there's only so much you, you can understand in an increasingly complex um, space. And at that time, you know, I, I knew that we wanted to be an investor, but there was not really anything to invest in. There were no companies per se to invest in. You could buy a bit of Bitcoin, eventually you buy some ETH. Um, but there weren't really businesses. And so um, we we spoke to about a thousand startups, blockchain startups, wow. um, who were really kind of just bolting on the word blockchain to their business. They weren't making any fundamental change to their business model. They didn't really understand uh, the concept of decentralization. And they created something called uh, Blockchain Angels, which at that time was this 
circuit we do around Europe in lots of European cities. At that time, we'd get like no more than like 10, maximum 20 people show up who were angels that were interested in blockchain. Um, and we kind of like whoever was around was wanting to raise money, we kind of give them a stage and, and maybe they pick up a few small checks. But we spoke to a lot of startups and we, we became convinced that uh, there was no point really looking at the application layer at that point or for several years because there was just a huge amount of infrastructure that have to be built because we knew that because I'd have Aaron breaking it every time he'd try and create like an MVP. Um, so in the early days, we were a bit more of a studio and the goal wasn't really necessarily to launch startups that we thought would be successful because you know, we knew that the limitations of the technology would would stop that startup being successful in a conventional sense, right? You know, it's just too costly, too clunky. You were forfeiting so much around like a classic web two experience that anybody would, you know, use it at scale. Right. Um, but it, it gave us the grounding and learning to try out different use cases. Um, then um, R3 came along and really changed the level of attention that was in, in the space with the banking consortia that created, it kind of um, legitimized the space a lot more. And you had a lot of guys, primarily in banking, a lot of them either still working in banks or kind of you know retired young from, from banks. And I think they intuitively got it because they understood financial services. They knew obviously, you know, ledgers and, and international trade. Um, and, uh, and so that kind of really changed the profile of the space because before that I was doing, you know, panels with a couple of people on it to rooms of tens of people in like major cities around Europe. Like nobody was interested. And there were a lot of very weird people um, floating around. Uh, maybe I was one of them. And um, and so we, uh, at that point, I, I just started to have other angel investors come up and say, look, I know this is going to be something. I can't time it. It's too complicated for me. I've got a day job. Um, can, can I invest in you or with you? And so we created uh, Outlier Ventures, which is actually a partnership. It's an LLP partnership. So it's not a GPLP fund. We don't manage the party money. It's our own money. I think we're about 30 partners now that we've built up over the last seven years. Um, and we kind of, you know, collectively work together, especially in the early days when we didn't have like a central team, we'd kind of just do DD together, we'd invest together. Um, and we focused more on the infrastructure layer because we, we became convinced that a lot of these use cases at the application layer were a long way away. And the best bet we could make was on the infrastructure that would make these use cases possible. Uh, so um, we then created an incubator. We kind of hired a few more people to work for the partnership full time um, to work with early stage projects on making a lot of decisions, primarily technical decisions because they were lower down in the stack, um, but also around you know how they might design their token economy. So. We incubated Fetch.ai, for example, Fet, the Fet token. We did that over several years, um, and uh, and several others. We were like friends and family around with Ocean, and um, way back, you know, we were the first institutional investor in IOTA, um, uh, and that was interesting to us primarily because you know they were experimenting with a different approach at that time with a DAG, um, but also the IoT component. So when we developed our um, when we were focusing on the infrastructure layer, we developed a thesis. Um, we had a head of research called Lawrence Lundy, who I think we were talking earlier, you, you, yeah. you come across a few times. And we developed this thesis, which was, look, actually, you know, what, what does DLT represent? And for us, it represented a new, primarily a new data economy. Um, and so what we meant by that was, I mean, everything's data. Um, like, you know, Bitcoin is data now. It's, you know, it's, it's numbers that are moved around um, on the ledger and uh, that produces metadata and everything else. Uh, but we, we kind of became convinced that actually you had to look at DLT in the context of other technologies around data. So IoT was obviously the thing that would be collecting data. DLT would be the thing that would organize and commodify data. Um, and then AI would be the thing that would increasingly consume that data for greater degrees of like automation. 
And so we called this thing the convergent stack, and that led us to make all of these kind of investments. So IOTA was because of their play in IoT. Yep. Um, at least back then, that was the, the primary focus. Fetch was uh, some guys from DeepMind who were looking at agent-based systems. Ocean was data marketplaces. Enigma, now Secret, was, of course, um, Secret Compute and pri Privacy Preserving Protocol. Um, and so we made kind of several bets. Um, we're involved in Chainlink um, pretty early um, around Oracles and Dear Data more recently, which is um, crowdsourced Oracles. And so we kind of made all of these strategic investments. We only made a handful, but we were very large shareholders in these networks, sometimes up to 7% of supply. Um, and then probably uh, two years ago, we felt that there was enough infrastructure being built now that some of these use cases could start to play out and we could move further up the stack. So we started to invest at the middleware. As we stopped really investing at the infrastructure layer, we, we do have a couple of plays, which I would argue are like primitives that are going to be lower down in the stack, like Boson, which is physical to digital redemption. Um, I'll maybe get to that a little bit later around, you know, how do you make the metaverse, the metaverse, this ubiquitous physical and digital thing. Um, but primarily we've moved up the stack middleware layer. So when people talk about adoption, they're usually thinking about consumers. But actually, if you think about, um, you know, DLT infrastructure, the users are primarily um, developers, right? And sub 1% of the global developer community are remotely doing anything on blockchains at the moment. So a huge amount of adoption is going to come from helping developers make this stuff usable, not just individual protocols, but combinations of protocols as a stack, as a Web3 stack. We talk about Web3 all the time, um, but at the moment, it's still very disjointed. And so how do you make that into a holistic stack that could then be applied to um, particular verticals, industries. Um, and then, uh, so in concert with the middleware play, we we're also investing at the application layer now. And because of that, a lot of the stuff we were doing deeper down in the stack, um, we didn't need to do anymore. Um, mm -hmm. And we could effectively condense a lot of the learning that we've had over the last seven years into more of an accelerator format. So two years ago, we decided we would shift from the incubator model to an accelerator. We do um, cohorts. Initially, it was cohorts of five. They're now cohorts of 10, um, three a year. So at least 30 startups will go through that accelerator. Um, and uh, we began to focus more at things like uh, DeFi, NFTs, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but also still things around new data economy, pr privacy tech, anything that's about unbundling Web2 platforms, user centricity. Um, so now our portfolio is around 30. So um, this year we'll double that from 30 to 60. Um, actually, probably more than double because we've now got a later stage offering. So the accelerator is called Basecamp, which is typically pre-seed seed stage. Um, and then we have Ascent, which is Net, um, projects where the network's about to go live in six weeks or so, or they're a live network, um, but they're failing to get traction. And so we'll probably work with uh, 20 projects in that. So it could be up to 50 projects this year. Wow. Um, um, but primarily around this DeFi NFT data play. And actually, um, I guess we'll, we'll talk about this a bit later, you combine all of those things. And uh, my thesis is, that that makes the open metaverse. And so actually all of these things uh, come into play and reinforce one another to allow for um, uh, this thing called the metaverse that can be experienced, but with the DNA, pregnant with the DNA of Web3, user centricity, decentralization, and all the good stuff. Very, very cool. I was looking at the uh, Basecamp website here too for um, your, your base camp. And so it's a three month remote accelerator, uh, remote first, especially now with the world we're living in. Uh, $50,000 immediate funding for 6% equity and tokens, up to 200,000 total funding available per team. Yeah, really interesting. Uh, I, 
actually, do you have folks already slated for this to start then? Is this all filled up then for, um, yeah. for the end of February? So um, we're already uh, three weeks into the winter cohort. Um, okay. We've got 10 projects in that. I would say um, probably 40% are NFT, 40% to DeFi, 10% are new data. Um, actually, I think we were talking off air. You mentioned um, the Token Smart crew as part of NFT42. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, and actually, there's this interplay. That it's not so clear cut. So we've got a DeFi project that's actually leveraging NFTs from a loyalty context. We've got NFT projects that are leveraging uh, DeFi. Um, and so it's kind of blurring a little bit. And what's really what's exciting about this particular cohort is that like within week one, I think pretty much all of them are integrating into one another, like um, in, in one way or the other. And also the 30 projects that we've got in our previous um, uh, cohorts, our, our portfolio. And so what's starting to happen is you get real network effects with an accelerator, right? Because not only do we have you know, seven years worth of network with all the leading founders. I've got a podcast called The Founders of Web3. A lot of the founders on that um, are mentors in the program. Um, you know, whether it's Roham at Dapp Labs, we've had on, I think, we've had Stane from Aave. Um, they, uh, we, we've also got a lot of the later stage projects in our portfolio are collaborating with uh, the new ones that come through. So Biconomy, which is, um, uh, solving for like meta transactions you know they're being leveraged by i think five startups in the cohort already because of course that's a major barrier to adoption um so it's it's actually really beautiful to watch because like as we double the portfolio almost every year now um the the combined network both in terms of mentors investors really work so you mentioned some of the economics there um, and, you know, sometimes that might seem like a small amount of money to give to somebody, but effectively that's a stipend because within the program um, they close, you know, millions. Um, so, for example, if you have um, somebody like Kudos, uh, Kudos just went out at a billion dollar market cap when they graduated from the later stage project Ascent. Um, Dear Data went out at, uh, I, don't, I can't remember what the all time high was, but it's I think about 700 million, um, uh, something like Boson. I'm not sure I can say the, the exact number, but you know they've just closed several million in their mm -hmm. first private round. They're um, many multiples oversubscribed. And so um, really the goal of the program is to help them close the seed round, close as much money for as little, you know, for as high valuation as possible, little dilution as possible, but then most of them to get to the point of being able to do um, a token launch, which is, you know, where they have utility as a product, they've got community momentum, traction, and, and they have a good treasury to kind of survive whatever happens in the market, right? Because we've been here for seven years. Like we actually accelerated uh, at least 20 startups during the last crypto winter. I think we were the most active investor in Europe, not by ticket size, but by volume, deal volume. Um, so we're pretty evergreen. We're here like doing what we do, whether the market's up or down. And we try to make sure that the projects that go through the program, either either by raising through equity, safe, SAFs, like whatever it is, they've got enough runway to survive uh, a bear market because there will be another bear market, right? Yeah. There's always another bear market. I, I know it's something, uh, it feels like we all lived with PTSD from the last bear market. And then suddenly we realize, hey, we're not in a bear market anymore. Are we halfway through a bull market? Oh no, oh no. So some another one's coming and yeah. Uh, Jamie, why don't we define for those that are, are new to this, uh, how do you define the metaverse? And then right after that, I think we can hop into Decentraland and um, as we start to talk through some of these issues, because some of them are are easier to like bring to light just by looking at it uh, in Decentraland. But yeah, how do you define it, uh, the metaverse? Yeah, so 
actually to answer that question has taken a lot of brain power. Um, it's a tough one. It <laughs> sounds easy. Uh, notice I don't want to answer it. I'm like, yeah. oh, Jamie, you, you define it. And that's, that's the problem, right? Because um, a lot of it is rooted in science fiction and much of that, like, you know, from the eighties, right? So a lot of it is either redundant or, um, or is kind of steeped in folklore and yeah, you know, this, this futurism and actually that that's helpful and not helpful because on the one hand, you know, the metaverse is the future at the same time, my argument is we're already in it with the beginnings of it. And so, um, it's really important to not think of the metaverse as some far off destination, but a process. And that process has already begun. And the dystopic view on that, if you look at, you know, Ready Player One, where you've got a single corporation trying to control the metaverse's economy, uh, where it can delete people, it can, you know, alter the monetary policy, the amount of money, money in the system. Um, you know, that is a process of capture and control, right? Um, and the reason why that's not too difficult to believe is you just look at the web now, right? It's dominated by a handful of platforms, whether that's Amazon, whether that's Facebook, whether it's Google, um, they're platform monopolies. That makes them data monopolies and that makes them AI monopolies. And the AI advantage that they get becomes so advanced that even if you wanted to kind of break those shackles, you would have to accept a much inferior web. And most people aren't prepared to do that, right? Most people are about convenience rather than a lot of the principles that I know people in Web3 care about. So a big thing for me is impressing upon people that the Web3 is already beginning and it's important that we begin to think through its design choices so we don't just um, either perpetuate the flaws of the web that exist now that we're aware of but we actually don't deepen them. And so like an example of that is if you accept this concept that, you know, surveillance capitalism and how platform monopolies um, are this kind of this, this um, digital serfdom where they're just harvesting our data uh, with, you know, free product. Um, and then you think about Facebook and Oculus, you put a headset on, they're capturing biometric data. So, data about your physiological response to visual stimuli that you're not even aware of. And you think it's Facebook that's got that data. And you can start to think, shit, you think about AR, they're capturing spatial data of your room, your house, you know, combine that with Alexa that's in your bedroom, that's in your kitchen. Um, you know, they've pretty much got a complete profile of you, your family, your daughter, you know, your mistress, like well, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So like that's pretty scary. And um, as the metaverse becomes more ubiquitous, the more invisible it becomes. And therefore, um, uh, you know, the more the more intrusive that the, the more people will just accept that, right? Because it's not so in their face. So like long way of getting around to it. But then you say, okay, well what is what is the metaverse? So um, the way that I look at it, and I'm going to release a paper next week called uh, the Open Metaverse OS Operating System. So I believe, like, if you're going to look at it crudely, there are two ways that the metaverse can go. And actually, you can put it on an axis, so two axes. So um, one is open, one is closed. And the other one is hi-fi and lo-fi. Now, the hi-fi and lo-fi one, isn't so important other than it's maintained, right? So if you look at crypto voxels, the beautiful thing about crypto voxels is, is it's deliberately lo-fi in that as long as you've got a smartphone, any an internet connection, anyone in the world can join that economy um, and can uh, generate value, potentially generate a living. And so from an inclusion perspective, that's obviously really important if we're going to be onboarding um, you know, the world's population. Now, that said, um, most people on the planet don't have a smartphone, so it's not totally inclusive. Um, but on the other end of the spectrum, you've got something like Oculus or in an open context, Somnium, where they're actively pushing the boundaries with the hi-fi, the level of experience there. Now, um, that's also great because we want to have um, a high end of content and experience 
but the cost to join our economy is currently prohibitively high for most people. Like, so for me to use my, to go into VR insomnium, I had to use my gaming PC, which costs a few thousand plus an Oculus headset, which is a few hundred quid. Um, and so, you know, I then somehow need to um, recoup that cost. Now that again is possible with the metaverse if you're a creator um, or you're speculating on virtual land or, or the tokens that, that govern these spaces, but that's the kind of technical axis. But the more important one is the open and closed one. And the problem with this is it's a little bit like decentralization. It's not binary. You're not decentralized or centralized. Um, and just like you're not gonna be open or closed. There's multiple ways of assessing um, how open you are. It could be, you know, is your code open source? It could be your economy. Um, but it, it, gets, it becomes a very useful tool to look at the metaverse as it is and say, well, actually there are different instances of the metaverse at the moment. Um, so if you look at uh, most massively multiplayer online role-playing games or even things like Fortnite, these are closed economies, right? Mm -hmm. So the value that you earn in that economy cannot be taken out of that economy. It is a closed economy. Yep. You can't even move it out into fiat because of money laundering, right? The most governments are pretty scared about that. So it's a closed economy. One company controls that. That is Ready Player One. Like you do not want that if that one company or that one platform becomes a big chunk of the metaverse and how we experience the metaverse. Um, so just even around in-game assets, and it's really important if you think about, there is a generation whose who's primary wealth is digital and locked into these platforms. Like if you're a gamer and you're 18 or 17, like most of your wealth is digital and it's locked in these platforms. You're never gonna be able to borrow against that to buy a house, right? Um, so they are financially excluded by virtue of being a digital native or a metaverse native. Um, so it's really important that we open up these economies and so, if you look at something like um, Somnium or CryptoVoxels or uh, Decentraland, these are more open instances. Yes, uh, there is still an entity that has determined the fiscal and monetary policy of that economy, but it is an open economy. You can freely move out value. Um, increasingly, you'll be seeing portability of uh, identity, so we've got a project called Crucible that we work with, Crucible Network, that's working on um, interoperable identity between gaming engines, um, like Unreal, but then also um, instances of the metaverse. Um, you'll then be able to have avatars that work in multiple instances. You'll be able to have in-game assets that are transferable. You'll be able to have um, a 3D model or bit of furniture, a building that you can actually port in between worlds, right? So uh, I think for me, if you go back to the definition of what the metaverse was in a science fiction context, it was primarily this idea that um, there was a single virtual economy that was not under the control of a government. Now, um, what I propose is, is that with the open metaverse, there's many principles around it, but the most important principle is that there is a virtual economy that is native to the internet, mm -hmm. which can connect instances of the metaverse um, and cannot be controlled or captured by a single corporation or government and is not dependent on a fiat system. Um, and so that's kind of the core of my thesis for a metaverse. And so that's why it's really important. You said at the top end, there's this blurring between DeFi and NFTs because DeFi is how that happens in the metaverse. Yeah. NFTs are like the, the, the value, it's the, it's the thing, it's whether it's a, a yeah. ticket to a virtual experience, whether it's a virtual good, it's an avatar, it's the collateral, it's the, it's the digital wealth. But DeFi is the thing that's going to enable um, that to become a real world asset, um, which can allow me to borrow against that, to buy a house, to pay my rent. Um, and so the, the kind of consistent thing around what is a metaverse is this idea of blurring the physical and the virtual to the point where it's indistinguishable. indistinguishable. And so I believe that um, you know, DeFi and NFTs are 
how we get there. So so well said. Uh, I'll look forward too to the article coming out. So just to summarize, uh, I, I think uh, a lot of what you've covered there is that the, the metaverse is is where living in a, a digital virtual world is your primary. It's digital first living. It's a digital first community, uh, and it's to the point that we're talking about a future where. Uh, you don't have to even distinguish it as digital first. It's just, I mean, that's where I spend all my time. That's where my friends, my community, that's where my stuff is. And, and that stuff that we talk about at this point is um, NFTs. So that's that's been a real breakthrough for us over the last few years is digital scarcity. So being able to own something and it be unique and it be mine, um, owning it in my Ethereum wallet. And uh, yeah, I mean, like, I guess like what you've described is unlocking like there's a bunch of buzzwords here that I always use and everyone uses and I'm like trying to like figure out a way to not use them but uh, Stani talks a lot about it with Ave you know that they just want to unlock liquidity that if you own an asset you should be able to collateralize it borrow against it eventually do under collateralized um, loans against that same idea here we have, uh, you know, I grew up with like Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Sega, all that. And like now we've advanced to a point where there is an economy within these games, which was huge. It's very exciting, but it's a closed economy. And so like what happens when someone, you know, participates in that economy, puts all their time and energy into it, has an asymmetric sort of expertise and ability that is valued by the economy, but isn't able to do what you can do in, you know, the traditional finance world. Uh, you know, it, it's it's the same thing as, uh, well, I mean, a few examples here are personal tokens have been exciting to watch because you're like borrow, you're essentially, uh, you're tokenizing yourself and you're maybe borrowing from the future of like how valuable you might be. Uh, and then what we talked about here with like if you're playing Axie Infinity and you are very good at that uh, and the community clearly values that and they want your Axies, you should be able to borrow against those Axies. So yeah, I mean, to, to dumb it down for anyone and I would, I would highly recommend they read this article when it comes out because it does an incredible job of summarizing all of this. Uh, it is about being able to, uh, have the market dictate what is the value of anything. And in the metaverse, again, like we think of it as this, it's it's a place that you live, it's digital first living. And so everything that makes up that, that metaverse, just like the home that I live in or the car that I own, which even though a lot of these assets actually are not very capital efficient in traditional finance, that's where DeFi comes, comes to play with the metaverse. It's digital first finance that should allow people to do more with their money whenever they want. Just do, do what you want when you want with your money. Um, and I yeah. build on that and say that um, like the key thing about the metaverse is, is it, it's ubiquity, right? So um, there's some really interesting things happening. If you look at LiDAR technology, right? So LiDAR technology, which is, you know, what's used in self-driving cars to kind of create 3D models of, the physical space around it and then to kind of make decisions and determination well that's now like commodified it's in you know the latest smartphone um so uh you can render an object now via your smartphone and at some point and i'm trying to get somebody to do it it'll happen at some point through your mobile phone you'll be able to render a physical object mint it into an nft and immediately sell it into a marketplace um, and so there'll be this mass rendering of the world, right? Buildings, streets, objects, people, sometimes with permission, largely without permission. It will be turned into value. Um, and very quickly, the metaverse will be pop populated with um, uh, physical value that's effectively you know, rendered and turned into virtual value. Now, sometimes that will be attributed to the owner um, through royalties and like brand franchises and, and sometimes it will it will be pirated in effect um, but you've also got this it's like bi-directional flow right so 
you'll have entirely new forms of virtual only value created in the form of NFTs. Um, and so, for example, uh, you know, that, that could be a piece of art. Um, it could be uh, a ticket to virtual experience. I think increasingly NFTs are going to become experiences. So at yeah. the moment, they're kind of something you have in your wallet. Maybe yeah. you'll like you'll you'll show off through OpenSea, but like it's it's a, not a very social experience. Increasingly, what's going to start happening is, and this is what we're doing with 100x District, is I want to show off these things in a virtual environment. They are, um, they are, so they are social experiences. Um, yeah. and again, like NFTs can also give access, right? So NFT42 built this thing where if you have a certain um, uh, NFT in your wallet, you'll get access to a Discord server or rooms in a Discord server or rooms in VR chat, right? So um, they become uh, they become a uh, social device, an access device beyond just a form of speculation. Um, we've also got a project in the cohort uh, which has got probably one of the most degen projects going. It's like um, they they allow. It's called a meme market. So if you think about the meme economy, which drives the internet culture, um, like the only people that make money from memes are advertisers. And they make a shitload of money from the attention that happens around a meme. Um, but what if you could have the provenance of a meme? And so this uh, uh, project called Marble Cards is allowing people to um, marble uh, uh, points in the evolution of a meme all the way down to its originator and effectively like speculate on that meme as a bonding curve. And so even a meme, like a, a which is an incredibly social experience, is gonna become, a, become an asset in DeFi. People are gonna speculate on its value. They're gonna be able to um, mint that into NFTs um, and have a stake in it. And so I think you're gonna see the mass financialization of internet culture, and that turned into collateral that will be leveraged in DeFi. And so there's going to be a huge amount of virtual first wealth creation. That's nothing to do with the real world physical economy, other than it will pay for people's food, homes, you know, and all the all the good stuff of of uh, living. And of course, you've also got play to earn. You mentioned Axies. Um, play to earn is nothing new, but um, in things like Axies, there are whole villages in uh, in um, Southeast Asia yeah. who are churning playing axes um, for a living. Like that's how they pay the rent and feed their family. Um, and what I love about how they've designed axes as an economy is um, this idea that you can't just, you can't just be a capitalist. You can't just buy axes and not put them to work. They'll kind of decay if you don't put them to work. So if you want to be a capitalist, you can buy the assets like the best axes, but you have to have people play them so they either A, don't decay in value, but ID they improve in value. So you have to create jobs. So you've now got digital venture capitalists creating jobs for mm -hmm. people so that their assets don't decay in value. And that's like mind blowing because this is like feeding feeding whole families in um, in parts of the world. So which which is a wonderful story. And it's it's about uh, in some cases it's about unlocking virtual wealth that you know is native to that economy but it just goes back to like th this it's that idea that i think i heard stani talk about just unlocking liquidity in whatever you want and uh like even one that came up the other day so uh you probably know who this is there's a a young woman who is an astrologer and she's she's on twitter and tiktok doing uh uh, Bitcoin's like ast astro astrological reading. I don't even know how to say it, but she's very entertaining. And um, I, you know, all I'll say is I've I've seen her before do this. And and what was uh, what's remarkable to me, what I didn't know. So I mentioned this to my wife and was like, you know, um, there's this young woman who like has you know done a few readings and like she like spot on hit some corrections in the market and. All I'll say is uh, it, it's been entertaining to watch, like the the community react. And I think she's, again, I think she's really, you know, uh, she handles herself really well. Like I, I, she's, 
she's got a great following. Anyways, my point being is she has an incredible following on TikTok. So I didn't realize this. I said this to my wife and she's like, oh yeah, I know who that is. Uh, like, you know, she does daily horoscopes. And my sister said the same thing. And I'm thinking to myself, here's an example of someone who, um, uh, throw aside, you know, whether you believe in the reading she does or not. I, I'm not trying to affirm that. I'm saying that she does something that people value, whether it's for entertainment or whether they're putting their faith in the fact that these readings are real. She could tokenize herself right now. She could go and create a personal token and, and the, the market will decide what the value of that token is. And now she's taken this, uh, she's unlocked what was locked up, I would say in like TikTok, you know, TikTok essentially, you know, owns that value. Uh, even if you do promotions or whatever, all, all the stuff that we see like, you know, um, influencers and creators do. And she could allow the market to, to value her and say, hey, I, I, I think what you're doing uh, has upside to it. And then now she's got something potentially that she can borrow against. Uh, in the future, it, it, you know, which allows her to then advance that capital into, you know, the the physical space that she lives in if she wants to do that, unless maybe she buys a plot of land in Decentraland and um, starts to build there. So, you know, there's so many examples in the world we live in now where all these theses are already playing out. Uh, it's remarkable how much that's advanced over just the last few years. But like, once you start to dig into what we're talking about, I would tell you it's impossible to not start to see the dots connecting all around you. And and like I said, this is an example of someone, when I think of personal tokens, I was like, she absolutely should tokenize herself. Like she's got she's got a great following. I, I mean, people would love to, anyways, if she sees this, please like go talk to Roll or whoever else can help you with it. Um, Jamie, should we hop into Decentraland though? As we just we can continue talking yeah. about like I had a, you know a number of questions here for you like you know wanted to dig into more about um, you started to talk about the two versions of the metaverse like which is like closed versus open closed being more dominated by big tech so we started to sort of um, cover that but um, also want to talk about you know what's missing in the Web three stack to enable the metaverse to really flourish. Um, so, uh, let me go ahead and I'm going to put up a banner here for, so this is, oh, let me just cut this down a sec. Check out, um, zero X art. Here we go. This should be easier to read on screen. Check out, uh, zero X art. So this is the NFT art district in Decentraland. And if you just go to 100 X dot art, that's the correct website there. Yeah, that's that's it. Okay, cool. So I'll uh, share my screen. Here we go. Oh, actually, sorry. I'm going to share my other my Decentraland screen. So and maybe while I'm doing that, I think um, so. You touched on a really interesting point, which is for me, what's most exciting about NFTs are that they mainstream crypto and DeFi. So the large majority of people, um, and by the way, my username is is maybe rather aptly Coconut BB51. Um, I don't know why, because it's got a weird um, one of my wallets is plugged in, um, but I guess my head looks like a coconut. In well, some, you can see me there. I've got uh, yellow or blonde hair, however right. you want to describe it, and I've got a ponytail, so it doesn't. Yeah, I, I clearly don't know how to customize my avatar, but I like the look of my guy, so it looks well, cool. Well, it's quite limiting, right? I was really upset that I have to have like a, a bald guy, only partially bald. That's kind of not the look <laughs> I really want. But anyway, you know, it's early days. But yeah, so it's saying that um, the, the exciting thing about NFTs are that they mainstream all the stuff that we care about, crypto, DeFi, because the large majority of people will never go to a crypto exchange. They will never buy ETH or Bitcoin. Um, you know, the, the, this idea of cryptocurrency is just not something that they think about. They don't think about currency. You could argue maybe they will a little bit more um, with quantitative easing and everything else. But, you know, primarily it's, it's something most, because most people don't understand money full stop, right? Now, 
so for a long time, you know, as I said, I've been in the space for quite a while. There's a lot of people in my network that still don't really know what I do. Like friends of mine I've known for years, they're just like, you know, it sounds all a bit shady and I'm not really sure I get it. Um, and you know, I'm constantly trying to convince people I'm a legitimate business person and um, <laughs> nobody really yeah. believes me. Um, but the great thing about NFTs are people get it. Like you say collectibles, you say, you know, audio files, you say tickets, like these are things people understand, they're behaviors people understand. Um, and oh yeah, let's, let's, let's walk around. Um, Absolutely. So, Should we go exploring in, in this, the fifth dimension gallery or? Yeah. So to be honest with you, I've not been in, in a few days. So we've got, we've got like 25 galleries that are popping up. We're going to do a launch on Sunday. Um, so you can see the hundred X one where I was stood in front of actually one of the smaller ones here. Um, it's funny because I went in here like a week or two ago and this stuck out as like, whoa, that is a huge structure in here. But then this got yeah. built since then. This was it's gonna get bigger. It's going to get bigger, right? I think one is, so that's Stags. I think Max Stealth's one pops up somewhere here, which is like a monster. Um, you know, you've got, so by Sunday, I mean, I shouldn't even really be showing you around now because it's like a bit half up. Yeah, this is so this is going to open up on Sunday. But, you know, as as we discussed earlier, the, the metaverse is at least at this point is it's a beautifully open thing. You can just go to, again, 100 x.art if you want to go exploring. But uh, the exciting thing to me, Jamie, is like I've missed the social aspect of the metaverse so far, other than, you know, I've. I've loved going to WIP meetups in uh, crypto voxels. Yeah. And then um, actually we did some ethereal talks uh, in the uh, token smart lounge. And those were definitely like highlights to me of like, okay, we're all here. And it feels like I'm, I'm really like getting what I want out of socializing with others in the metaverse. Yeah. I mean, and this is it, right? So the great thing about the metaverse as an environment, and let's be honest, most most of these virtual worlds are empty unless there's a specific event on, right? So if you're just walking around, it's very unlikely that you're going to bump into people. Um, but when there is an event on, it's a focal point to create a social experience to socialize NFTs. Um, and so like to finish off what I was saying earlier, um, so I've got a young daughter, seven-year-old daughter, and I've been able to play axes with her, right? And this is the first time she actually understands what I do for a living. She's like, oh, I get it. So we can buy cards and we can trade them and they, they're oh, only on the internet. I love so, it. You know, it love kind it. of brings to like, as a DeFi dad, you'll, you'll kind of get this yourself, right? Um, Absolutely. This is something you can do with your family all the way down to your daughter. I know you're saying your wife thinks you're a bit weird hanging around with mid-aged men on the internet in playing yeah. games. She's like, oh, yeah, this isn't weird. She's like, sure, this is, oh, your friend is a uh, coconut BB5. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I have nothing to worry about. Here's, yeah, here's right. the If you look at like Sandbox, for example, Sandbox is going to onboard all kinds of demographics. Um, kids, if you think about the financial literacy that is going to come out from something like Sandbox, kids can go in there, they can buy a bit of land, they can build a shop, they can create and sell virtual goods. Um, some of them will be millionaires, um, yeah, um, you know, probably before many people listening to this this uh, this yeah. show. Um, uh, they're going to embarrass us all by how good they are because this is going to be native to it, right? Um, and so this is this is how we onboard a billion people into crypto. And as I said, like there's artists that I work with that I've onboarded into NFTs who. I just found on Instagram, I love their work. And I was like, look, you should really turn that into a um, into an NFT. And they're like, well, what's an NFT? And I'm like, well, you know, you could create a digital instance of your work. Um, and I've got some of them on Super Rare. They've sold their work. They've made more money than they've ever made in their life. And all of a okay. sudden, they're having to figure out, well, okay, how do I, what's ETH? Oh, shit, there's, there's gas prices. Um, how do I hedge against that? Okay, well, there's a stable coin. Um, and then as more of their wealth becomes digital, they start to go care about things like DeFi. And so how people care about crypto, how people care about self-sovereignty, sovereignty of data, money, wealth is going to be a byproduct of 
the gateway drug that is NFTs. Um, I think gaming's going to be a really big one. I think hip hop's going to be a really big one. We've got a startup in our current cohort who've created a beat maker that randomizes beats for people to rap over and then it mints it as an NFT. Um, and so they're onboarding like the hip hop community, which are already, you know, actively involved in things like Bitcoin. That's one third of all streaming on the internet. Like that's a huge culture. It's not even a subculture. Wow. And so as artists begin to, um, you know, Travis Scott, right, did the Fortnite thing, it broke records, but that was somebody else's platform. Yeah. He was like, pay, I don't know if he was paid to do it, but you know, it was really like, we're going to give you the reach of people on our platform. Now imagine if Travis Scott could do that in his own world, in Decentraland, um, and monetize that relationship uh, directly with his fan base. So I think artists are going to cotton, cotton on to this. So yes, this is Max Stealth's gallery. Max Stealth wow. is one of the bigger collectors in the space. The guy's a madman, actually, if you watch him do do bidding. Um, I often uh, have a, a WhatsApp group open with him whilst he's doing it. Um, uh, as he tells me, um, he, he's going to just intentionally break a record. Um, and uh, But he's... Oh he's, yeah, he's this is a beautiful gallery. Oh, my God. Like, I mean, the, all of these I, I'm, I kind of marvel at, but like... Wow, like just the creativity that goes into this. Do you happen to know is is it Voxel Architects? Like, is there anyone else that's that's doing what Voxel Architects does? Yeah, there there are um several. Um so uh I always forget people's first names. So there's Top Sam, I forget the name of the company he's got. He does some really interesting things. He's actually they do worlds and avatars. So they're currently building uh they're turning a dirk. Um, avatar, which is like a shaman, into um, into a avatar that will work in Decentraland in VR chat in crypto voxels for me, so it'd be interoperable. Um, so there are there are kind of several guys. There aren't enough to be honest with you because there's more demand than there are creators that like know the nuances of getting a video to work in on a wall in an art gallery in Decentraland, right? So it's still a lot harder than you think. How do you make sure that if you have a space like this, that this building doesn't cause the browser to crash because somebody's thrown up a weird 3D object, like, I don't know, that chair over there. Um, uh, you're not seeing it, but... Um, oh, no, here we go. No, I'm back in my uh, MetaMask logged out. So well, there you go, right? It, the, 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 these bugs, right? And so as people are pushing the boundaries... Um, there, there are very few people that know how to remove um, the friction or the, the UX problems. Um, wow. But for example, Voxel Architects are really interesting. So they've got several brands. They've got Crypto Motors. So they're building – these are actual people that designed cars for BMW and Mercedes, and they're building NFT cars. Um, and, you know, they're coming up with some crazy ideas, which will be virtual first cars, but that might go on and make physical cars. Um, so you're going to see this weird blurring of virtual first businesses and brands that end up making things in a physical world much more than you're going to see, you know, physical brands move into the virtual world. Um, you're seeing a lot of fashion brands at the moment creating digital wearables. I think Adidas are doing a few things. Um, so... You know, at the moment, in this thesis that I release next week, I talk about empty worlds. Like, at the moment, it's very easy. You go into crypto voxels, you go into the central land, you walk around when an event's not on, and you're like, there's nobody fucking here. It's like an empty world. This is never going to catch on. Yeah. But the thing is, um, the content is going to get easier and easier to do. There are web standards now, uh, open standards around 3D modeling, as I said, you've got things like LiDAR, where you don't have to design something, just render it. Um, you know, you, you, there'll be repositories, there'll be people open sourcing, there'll be an IKEA of NFTs, I'm sure. I'm like, if anyone's working on that, I will give you money tomorrow. Um, you know, there'll be there'll be like um, the H and M. I don't know if that's a brand you've got in the US. Like people that just make mass market wearables um, wow. for, for NFTs. So content's coming. Um, it's going to be led primarily by high-profile creators, as you say, that already have millions of followers on TikTok, on Instagram, 
Um, they're going to start doing things in the metaverse. They'll bring millions of people with them. And the great thing is when they bring millions of people, it's not onto a closed platform. Like they're growing the economy for everybody. Um, and as more wealth gets generated in this space, it gets recycled back, right? So, yeah, it's it's like super exciting. I, I don't even know whose gallery this one is. I've not even seen this one yet. Yeah, right, I'm gonna find you. It's so cool. I mean, like, God, I was in here like just a few days ago. There's so much more that's been built. This gallery is insane. Um, here's another. Uh, you know, reminder of, of how like the metaverse is already reflecting, you know, what we know in, in the meat space, you know, the fact that these are, uh, I think these are ads by Metacast. It might, may or may not be, but uh, yes, please. that's it. Yeah. So, I mean, here, here is, you know, the future of advertising, like same thing as, as you would see in, in our world, but if you're going to live in a space, if everyone's going to be there in this art district, if this becomes, you know, a destination for people to, um, you know, to learn about digital art and experience digital art, uh, just having stuff like this up will help people to, you know, to learn about all the other cool opportunities in here. So, well, I, I kind of I, like, um, so I, I don't want to talk about them too much, but it's hard not to, to be honest with you. So NFT42 are creating vending machines. They did one with Joy, Joy Toy vending machine. Wow. So it's like a vending machine in the virtual world. You go up to it, um, and they're creating all different kinds of mechanisms. They could be like a lottery thing. It could be that you get a ticket out of it, but you basically interact. Um, and, and it, you know, the NFT is bought and minted in world. And maybe as a wearable, you can buy and then just put on instantly whilst you're in that world. So we're going to see so much more, both like replication of what we see in the real world. Um, but then also like entirely new things that we've not even thought of. Right. And like if you want to think to the extent, I think the cultural effect of this, when I think of my daughter growing up in, in this world. Right. Especially once you start putting on the headset, the VR headset, you're not constrained or tethered to a um a screen and you know as i'm sure you're aware with oculus like it's a workout if you're doing like virtual games in oculus i've got really fit just like you have to climbing up shit you're moving around it's not like on the sofa relaxing playing a game i'm like oh i need to feel ready to spend some energy when i go into vr it's like a really immersive experience and it's kind of like digital asset right it's like if you think about the cultural effect that happened in the 60s and 70s when everyone started dropping acid, they started to like question reality. Um, well, now you've got a headset on where you can have digital acid on tap. There's going to be a generation that are going to question what is reality, especially as, um, you know, you can construct a totally emotive experience in these environments that you just can't replicate in media currently, whether it's film or um, or even a game environment. Yeah, it is. It's it's so immersive. I mean, you can just tell as I'm like walking through all of this. Like I'm I'm experiencing a lot here for the first time, and it hooks you. You know, like I've I I've come in here, you know, without being on Yield TV, and you just kind of can get lost walking around. And uh, you know, right now. Sure, I, I look forward to there being more people in this eventually. I look forward to, uh, to, to you know, looking back and saying, wow, like, remember when you could just walk through there and there was, like, no one in there? <laughs> but, like, right now, I this was something I used to say with crypto voxels. Like, I can't believe I'm, like, this lucky that I know this thing exists and I'm enjoying all of this. And, like, I want other people to know about it, but, like, yeah, enjoy it while you have it all to yourself. Like this is a really, I mean, we're we're def definitely on the cusp of some like major explosion with, uh, with the metaverse. Like I, I mean, technically, if you look back at the last like decade, obviously this is my understanding from other friends that have been in the space longer is that like this already has been an explosion. That like just people like wanting to get an Oculus headset is a huge thing, but. The fact that these spaces don't require um, a headset is just awesome. You know, yeah. it's not everybody has a laptop. Not everybody has, uh, you know, an internet connection or a smartphone. But hey, like 
little by little, we're chipping away at those roadblocks that prevent, you know, any, any person from accessing this. And this is also too, like, you could go down the rabbit hole with, uh, I can never pronounce his name, but, uh, Balaji, the Balaji that everybody knows that was the CTO of uh, Coinbase. Uh, when he talks about uh, like a digital nation, I mean, if you spend time in Decentraland and you start to build community like this, you know, like I, I actually, I don't even know where you live, but I've, we've interacted a lot just here. And I've interacted a lot uh, with recently with Maddie, DCL blogger. I don't even know what he, he lives in Australia. I think at the end of the day, like, my loyalty, like my energy and time is all going into communities that completely transcend, you know, the, the physical community that, that I live in. I, I, a lot of my friends nowadays are, I don't even know where they physically live just because we, we've gotten to know each other through like Ethereum, uh, through uh, crypto voxels, through token smart, through you know, something like this, like, this is cool. You know, I'd love to meet up with you again in here. Like, I don't need to go to a conference to connect with people. Um, I will someday, you know, uh, hopefully, but like, I'd rather go to a virtual conference at this point. Leap well, off. I mean, you're right. I mean, COVID has just accelerated. I'd say it's accelerated the metaverse in both a good and a bad way by maybe even a decade, right? So as you yeah. say, people buying Oculus headsets, um, I mean, at, well, at one point during lockdown, you just couldn't buy one. They were just, um, they were sold out. And and that was almost every VR headset. Now they're going into closed environments right now. That's currently where the content is. But like to create content in a gaming context, especially in a triple A game, that's hundreds of millions of pounds. It takes years to make. You need a whole studio. Um, but there's lots of new things happening just in gaming generally. So like, there's going to be a, Google's working on browser ga browser based gaming, um, where you no longer even need a console. A lot of this stuff is also built on open standards, right? So um, there is the open economy, which I think needs to um, be be the economic bridge between these worlds. Um, but then there's just all the open standards that are happening in VR and 3D modeling, and browser based experience and UX. And they're all going to accelerate and compound one another. Um, and so, like, very quickly, yes, these worlds are empty at the moment um, mm -hmm. for people that are kind of just joining the space and they buy into the, the concept. Um, this is a great opportunity. You can buy some land. You can buy a parcel of land. You can buy the token that underpins a particular economy where you think you're going to get traction. Um, I mean, again, I don't even know where you are now, right? Um, there's just stuff. Oh, so cool. I know. I haven't seen this before. This this is definitely new. And, like, I, I don't know if uh, people can see. There was, like, a floating car. There it is. I mean, it's just cool. And then I, like, hopped on to, like, a little platform. You can see me struggling to get on it for, yeah. for a sec there. I mean, this is – and it's free. This is all free to check out. All you have to do yeah. is be willing to – you know, open up your laptop. Uh, in this case, if you go, you can go to decentraland.org, but I would recommend just go to 100x.art and then there's a, a link uh, there with the little Decentraland logo. This is so crazy. And it's, free, it's truly free, right? It's not like Facebook free, where it's free to use in That's return right. for data. Like there's no data being extracted here. Um, the economy will stand on, on its own. Um, so yeah, you know, you can get a stake in it, I think increasingly creators are going to be able to, they'll, they'll, their entire living will be made in these environments. Um, the, you know, they can reach global audience, you know, without the need for an intermediary to say what's cool and what's not. You know, I've worked with a few, I think the youngest artist I created was a 19 year old kid from um, the Czech Republic um, who minted some stuff. I, I bought his first three pieces of art. Um, I think he made more money from those three pieces of art than he's ever made his entire life. He was like over the moon. He's like, I can't believe this is happening to me, you know, and, and honestly, his career has just begun. He's hugely talented, but he's in the middle of nowhere in the Czech Republic. It's not, he's not in LA or London. Um, as you say, you know, as long as you have, you can afford the hardware and that is currently a, a bit prohibitively high if you want a good experience, but that will come down. Um, you can join this. You can join this economy. Um, so yeah, it's 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 super exciting, and I think it just kind of brings together 
all the shit that we've been working on for you know seven years or whatever as an industry it's making it real for the masses and, and they are coming a absolutely jamie i i'm conscious i've kept you way over time no surprise uh anything else that you wanted to cover like any other uh maybe like resources or follow-up that you'd recommend to folks who are who are interested in this uh can you remind me what, what's the like the unveiling date for uh the 100 xr uh district so we're doing um i think 7 p.m this sunday so i don't know what date that is that's like uh... is that uh 7 p.m eastern or oh, sorry uk time uk time okay there we go so 7 p.m sunday uh uk time and and again like if you want to join this I mean, that, that's a great time to show up because you'll be able to socialize, hopefully, with others. Uh, you really just you, you just connect to your Ethereum wallet. If you've never gone into Decentraland, that's the most complicated part about it. Um, get on a laptop. I, I'd recommend that over. Uh, can you get on Decentraland with your phone? I've, I've never tried to. Um, I don't think so. You know, you do it by your laptop. Ideally, if you've got a PC or even better, a gaming PC, you're going to have a better experience, like the yeah. average um, uh, um, notepad, notebook will will struggle a little bit. You can still do it as long as you've got good Wi-Fi. It might start making you know heat. Heat. It might get a bit hot. Um, yeah, so yeah. yeah, yeah, that's so, right. If you hear your your computer cooking, it means it's it's doing the job. It's yeah, it's working. Yeah. So, uh, so seven p.m. we'll do it, and then we pretty much got for like seven hours. There'll be a live auction um, in each gallery um, by at least two three artists. They'll be hosted on other platforms, but you'll have the artist talking about that work. Um, I think we've got a panel. Um, I think we've got uh, some fireside chats with some big artists. Wow. Um, so it's going to be a lot of fun. We'll probably have uh, yeah, a couple of hundred people in there minimum. Um, but of those people, you know, you'll have the hundreds, uh, world, hundreds biggest um, collectors. Um, you'll have some of the big artists in there, like Beeple and what have you, just walking around. You, you grab a virtual beer with them. Um, that's that's awesome. Bring bring it all bring it all to life. Uh, also, we've got this um, Open Metaverse OS report, which will go out next week. Um, I'll I'll drop it on my Twitter account. So that's Jamie uh, at Jamie two four seven. And if you're a startup working in DeFi NFTs. Um, apply at outlierventures.io slash Basecamp. And um, we're now recruiting for the next cohort, which will start in Q2. Um, and other than that, thanks for having me on, man. I really appreciate it. I love what you're doing. I think it's great for the space to kind of make this stuff accessible to people because um, it is complex. It sometimes is a bit weird. And I think you're doing a great job of, um, of translating that to a wider audience. I appreciate it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's really the, the luckiest gig ever. I, I get to, uh, I, I would be doing this otherwise. So, um, and, and on that note, reminder to everyone, make sure you try Zapper. Uh, if you have a DeFi portfolio, um, or if you have your Bitcoin on chain, you can track your Bitcoin on chain as well there. Uh, also too, we recently released a farming tab. So if you're interested in exploring new yield farming opportunities and trying to rank them by ROI and then uh, finding ways to actually enter that, which is what we call a zap, you can do that all at zapper.fi. Um, and then tune in for future episodes. You can watch, there's now 66 episodes if you go to tv.zapper.fi. And um, Jamie, I'm just gonna close it out here, but uh, if, if you hang out just a sec, if, if you have any other questions, we'll be in a green room um, once I like end this. Oh shoot, There, sorry, there was one question um, we didn't get to, uh, someone asked, we should answer this. Uh, sure. Any sci-fi book list you'd recommend? We, we talked about Ready Player One, of course. Um, anything else that you'd recommend folks uh, read? Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, I'm not that much. So my problem with a lot of the classic um, science fiction books are that, you know, they talk about a future that's kind of already here, like half here. So I'm, I'm not very good at um, kind of going back and reading um, some of the kind of staples of, of science fiction. I'm like aware of them. Um, yeah. uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of uh, more interested in um, things around um, like the self-sovereign individual and, and like that book was a bit pathetic. Um, 
it didn't talk about science fiction. But, I mean, I guess in a way it did, right? It, it kind of predicted we'd, we'd, we'd be here and some of the consequences of that on nation state, on fiat currencies. Um, so I think that's a, a really good one. I think there's a lot of stuff by Jaron Lanier. Um, Jaron Lanier is what well, he pretty much invented VR. Um, he's now a futurist. He's very opposed to the closed metaverse. Yeah. Um, so he's had several books um, on that, which I think are, are really important if you kind of want um, a futurist perspective on it all. I'd also recommend Surveillance Capitalism. It's a bit of a, like, it's a very meaty book. It'll take you, I don't know, if you anything like me, a long time to get through. But that basically talks about the paradigm of the Web2 business model. And I think that's really important, again, for us to understand as we're looking at the metaverse. So it's kind of, um, uh, it's, it's less science fiction per se than people that have a good analysis on this stuff. I think also maybe Master Switch, I think it's by Tim Wu, um, which talks about the bundling and unbundling in technology cycles all the way back to like cinema, um, the telephone, broadcast radio, um, cable, and, and now what's happening with the web. Because um, again, I think these are, like for me, the best way to understand the future is to understand the past. So I quite like people that give like a historical um, perspective on the evolution of technologies and then, and then play it forward. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, I, what I was more hoping for is just like what books you've been reading. Uh, we were talking more recently about uh, there's this book called Devil Take the Hindmost. And it's like a uh, it's a history of speculation. It's very interesting. Uh, definitely. You can always connect the dots, you know, to to a lot of what we've experienced in the crypto space, both good and bad. And yeah, no, I, I agree. Those are those are great books to to read. I'm embarrassed, actually, of how little I've read of it. I won't I, I know all the titles. I, I won't admit to which of those I've actually read, but um, Jaron Lanier is is one that uh, that's a common thread in every conversation. And um, of course, of course, uh, Snow, Snow Crash is another yeah, one. Cool. Right. So, um, well, hey, thanks so much, Jamie, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, you know, again, reminder: you can subscribe at tv.zapper.5. If you follow at yield underscore tv on twitter uh you'll see all the live streams uh the next episode will be this coming monday uh and that will be another DeFi class segment and then yeah if you have requests of folks that we should be interviewing like jamie please just uh you can dm me on twitter at DeFi underscore dad or uh reach out to us uh on the zapper team so um thanks so much for tuning in and um thank you jamie thanks for being so generous with your time thanks for having me on all right bye everyone have a great day